Well, hey, everybody, it's so good to be with you as we continue today in this series that we find ourselves, Sucker Punch Wisdom, looking at the New Testament book of James. Before we get started in this message, I just wanted to let you know that we are excited just a few weeks from now. It's going to be July, and we are doing a special edition of At the Movies, At the Movies Streaming Edition, Streaming Edition. We're going to bring some At the Movies messages based on some of our favorite streaming TV shows, and we can't wait to share that with you. Maybe you might see Yellowstone or Stranger Things or Ted Lasso. We can't wait to bring those to you. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make plans even right now to be in church. These are messages that are not shared online. Be in church throughout the month of July. If you've ever been to an At The Movies at Vortex Church, you know we have a lot of fun. Can't wait to share those with you. Now, before we get started today, I just want to review a little bit. We're in the second week of this series looking at the New Testament book of James. James is really the New Testament's book of wisdom. Wisdom literature is found all throughout the Bible. You see it in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. It's, it's in the Old Testament, but James is essentially the New Testament's version of wisdom literature. It's very punchy. It's very, if you've ever read the book of Proverbs, you feel like you're kind of taking some body blows. But, you know, James is great at the sucker punch. Last week, uh, our good friend, one of my good friends, Matthew Bunn, was with us and shared the first installment in this series looking at James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy. If you hear that chapter 1, verse to consider it pure You're so excited. What is going to be joy? Consider it pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds. It's a sucker punch. It's a sucker punch. Matt did such a good job going through that chapter. I encourage you, if you weren't in church, you haven't listened to that, go online, go to the podcast, go to the app, go listen to it. Today we're going to be in James chapter 2. And I'm, I'm excited. James chapter 2 is expanding in many ways. M- most of us don't know this. The, there were no chapters when these books were written. Actually, the, the chapters were added later. And so what's kind of interesting about James chapter 2 is that it's expounding on the very last verse in James chapter 1, which is this. Look at this. Religion that God our Father accepts, pure and undefiled religion, religion that our Father accepts us, pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. All right? Most scholars say James is listing three things. To care about orphans, those kids that are in our community who have, for, for some tragic reason, lost their parents. They're unable to take care of them. To care for widows, the elderly in our community who are powerless to take care of themselves and then though we're doing those things to also keep ourselves from being polluted and then he moves into chapter two and he addresses favoritism within the church which is a very important section we're not supposed to treat one person better than another one and if you think about it we couldn't do that if we're really taking care of widows and orphans. Why? Because those are going to be the least favorite in many regards. We're, we often make favorite those who give the most to us, who contribute the most to us, who add the most value to us. And what James is saying is saying, listen, if you're ever going to really have the heart of God to care for those who are powerless, you can't have favoritism. And then he moves into the passage that we're going to look at today, beginning in verse 14. So we're just going to take a moment right now, go to the Word of God without any addition. I'm not going to add any special kind of narrative to this. I'm just going to read through the passage we're going to look at today, beginning in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. 
But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? When he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. Can we take a moment and pray? Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this encouragement. Coming from the heart of James that we are to do what we believe. So help us today to see the things that live in our heart that have been very broken, very lost, the places where we have perhaps sensed your conviction, but we have not moved in faith in regards and in response to what you're doing in our lives. God, may it not be so. May you provoke us to a step of faith today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. James, in this passage, is addressing the disparity between our beliefs and our actions. The disparity, the distance between our beliefs and our actions, our behaviors. Why is he doing that? Because there's too often a gap between what we say we believe and what we do. There are, in many of us, in many of us, in you and unfortunately in me, there's a gap between what we say we believe and what we do. So today, what I want to do as we start this message, I want to address what I'm going to call common cultural convictions around the gap between what we say we believe and what we do. I want to address some common culture, the cultural wisdom of our day, some common cultural convictions. And the first one is this. It's a common cultural conviction that you can believe something and not act on it. You can be deeply convicted over something, moved by something, and yet never do anything about it. That we can have deeply held convictions about how the world is supposed to be, what people are supposed to do, and yet it never translates into behavior or action. It looks this way. It looks this way. Somebody would say, we should do something about fill in the blank. But then you never do anything about it. We should do something about homelessness. Have you seen the homelessness in our community? We need to do something about it. But you have never, not even once, sat down with a homeless person, to talk to them, to feed them. Never once volunteered at a homeless shelter. We need to do something about the foster care crisis in our community. Do you not know that there are more foster kids in our community than there are foster homes? We need to do something, but you have not once done anything to support a foster family, to even move towards receiving a child into your home as a foster parent. We need to do something. This is everywhere. We need to do something about Israel. But you've never done anything about Israel. We need to do something about progressivism and wokeism. But you've never done anything about that. I'm going to tell you something. Leading a church is a wild endeavor. It is a wild, every once in a while, there are things that happen as a pastor that just kind of inside 
You see these things coming because you see the patterns of behavior over time. And eventually it just kind of causes you to get maybe a little jaded and see some things as being a little bit more comical than they probably should. Okay? I'm just going to say, this is one of those things. It is not uncommon to have somebody as a pastor come up and go, Pastor, whoo, you need to do something about the homelessness, the foster care. And I'm going, I do. Why do I need to be moved by the conviction that God is laying on your heart? As a matter of fact, what we're doing as a church is reflective of a conviction that God laid on my heart. Why? See, the thing is, is that most people don't recognize that that conviction that God has put on your heart is to move you. It's to move you. For Jesus, when Jesus taught, the responsibility of obedience was always a personal matter. It was never like God's going to convict you to try to move somebody else. Now, in your movement, you might attract somebody who follows along, joins in the mission. But it's a personal matter. As a matter of fact, Jesus is teaching in Luke chapter 6 a very familiar for our church, a very familiar passage, the wise and foolish builders. You know, you build your life on the rock or you build your life on the sand. And the rock is building your life on the teachings of Jesus. You're, you're, you're obeying him. You, you hear God say to you, do this, and you respond in obedience. He opens in Luke chapter 6 that section by saying, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Why? I mean, the implied here is he's not truly Lord until you do what he says. He's not. Jesus is just saying up front, listen, if you're not obeying me, if you're not feeling and sensing the conviction that the Holy Spirit is laying on your heart, then responding personally and obedience, I'm not your Lord. I'm not. Don't call me that. You might admire me. I might be an influence, but I'm not Lord. I'm not boss. Do you know what the Bible calls someone who says they believe, but they don't do it? They say, we, we need to do something about the homelessness crisis, but they do nothing about the homeless. We need to do something about the foster care, but they do nothing about the foster care crisis. We need to do something about this, but they do nothing about it. The Bible calls them a hypocrite. A hypocrite. They profess things with their mouths, that they do not live out with their lives. Jesus is addressing a very religious group. In Matthew 15, when he says this, these are his words, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What they say and what they truly believe and do is, th this is very wide. The disparity, the gap, the distance between them is very wide. Yet we live in a world that tells you, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. You're, you're doing, just by caring, you're doing something about it. Just by posting online, you're doing something about it. Just by having the conversation, you're moving the needle. And the truth is, is that sometimes a conversation is what's needed, but sometimes you actually have to get in the game. And I'm going to argue that more often than not, the answer is that you get in the game. You live in a world that's propagating the lie that it's okay to care deeply about something and do 
nothing about it. And James is punching at that. It's a lie. There's another one that James also includes in this section that I want to address. It's also a common cultural conviction that belief in God is all you need to be saved. Belief in God. That's all you need. Just need to believe in God. That's all you need to be saved. My good friend, Dean Herman, not too long ago we're hanging out. Dean said, you know, I've never been to a funeral where somebody was going to hell. Because we believe culturally that you know what? They believed in God. You've heard it said. You probably even said it yourself. I, I mean, I know, I know, I know there was stuff about their life that was not in congruence with the things of God, but they believed in God. They, but they, believe, they believed in God. They believed. They believed in God. James, is. did you see what he said? He said, you believe that there's one God? Good, good. That's a good start. It's a good start. But notice he says this, even demons believe that, and they shudder. They shake in fear at the truth that there is one true God. They believe that. A demon believes in the one true God. They do. They believe that there's a God, but they are actively working to carry out the will of the enemy. That's their role. That's their job. And this can be entirely true of us. We can believe that there is a God, but be actively working to carry out the will of the enemy. The difference between a Christian and a demon is not what they agree on, because there is some agreement. We agree that there is one true God. The difference is found in what they do, who they serve, what they're surrendered to. Let me make this really simple. Belief in God is not salvific or redemptive. Those are theological words. Not salvific or redemptive. Just simply believing in God. They're simply believing that there is a God will not change you. That's redemptive. And it will not save you. That's salvific. And this is punching against a common cultural conviction. James is calling us to live different. He's calling us to a living faith, not a dead faith. And I, I just want to say this to you. I want you to hear this from me today. I want you to have a living faith. I want you to have a faith in your life that when you wake up until you go to bed, it is alive within your chest. It is pulsing within your soul. It is active within your mind. It is helping you decide how you're going to move and shapes your day. I want you to have a living faith. So let me give you three takeaways from today that I believe we take out of this passage that helps us live with a living faith, okay? And the first one is just an observation. Agreement is different than belief. Agreement. Mentally agreeing. Mentally agreeing. Mental agreement is not belief. Let me give you an example. Have some spou a, a spouse, a marriage that is in crisis, and so they sit down, right? Maybe the wife has kind of migrated away from the home because there's tension at home. And so she spent a lot of time with her friends, spent a lot of time at work. The husband feels the tension too. And so instead of being at home, he's devoted himself to hobbies. Maybe he's hunting or he's playing golf. But they sit down, they look at each other. We need to spend some time together. We're not spending the time. They may even come to an agreement on that. We agree. We agree. We need to 
spend time together. But until the belief is changed that I am better off not dealing with this tension. I would rather be over here with my friends. I would be rather over here hunting. Until the belief is changed, it doesn't matter what you agree on. When James says demons in hell believe in God, he's talking about their agreement. Demons agree with the Christian that God is real. They agree. We agree with this. We have, we have the same understanding of the dynamics of the spiritual universe in which we live. Belief is different than agreement. Belief is different because belief becomes behavior. Belief becomes behavior. If you paid attention, when James is talking about the demon's belief in a God, he says... They shudder. They shake in fear. Why? Because that belief has become behavior. Parents, please listen to me. This is why we do not parent behavior. We parent hearts. We parent beliefs. Because your child lied for a reason. Your child didn't clean their room for a reason. There's a belief that they hold that causes the behavior. We parent their hearts. We parent their beliefs. Okay? So the first thing we need to understand is that agreeing with an idea doesn't mean you believe in it. Because belief shapes the way that we move and work and live. The second thing I want you to see is that faith integrates what we believe into our actions. That's why in this moment, James is making the issue our faith. It's faith. What good is it? my brothers and sisters, if you, but you don't. You believe this, but your faith never becomes your works. What a good is it? And that's kind of interesting because in the first century, that phrase echoed all the time. What good is it? What good is it? What good? And it was always a resounding phrase around stuff that was no good. This is what James is getting at Pure religion. Do you remember? Pure undefiled religion is that we would care for widows, orphans, and not be polluted by the world. He's talking about the activity of our faith. Faith is constantly, actively applying our beliefs into our daily behaviors. You've experienced this. You may have even experienced it before you started watching this message. Maybe. Maybe came into a room and you look down, there, there, there's a chair. You believed in faith that that chair could support your weight. And so the faith that you have in that chair activated the behavior to sit in that chair. See, the issue is often not what we agree with, it's where we have placed our faith. That affects our behavior. It affects what we do. It affects what's moving from some sort of mental agreement or belief into our action. It's faith. Let me give you a few examples. Many of you might even mentally agree with the fact that if I attend a church, I should give to that church. You see the value. It it might be just simply, I know that I go to Starbucks and buy coffee, but I come to church and get coffee for free. Okay, I know that every week I drop my kids off to the daycare and I pay for child care, but I come to the church and I drop my kids off and I get several hours of child care ministry to my children. I get it for free. I sit in a counselor's office where I pay to get advice, but then I come to church and get counsel for free. You might mentally agree with the fact I know I should give. I know I should give, but you don't give. And the reason you don't give is your faith in life is anchored into your bank account. When it comes to provision, when it comes to what's been provided into your life, your faith is in your bank account. Instead of your faith being in the God who provided what is in 
your bank account because if your faith is in the God who provided it, then it's so easy to migrate and go, I must follow his plan. My faith motivates then my behavior. I know I should give. And so in faith, I know that God has given me everything that I have. I will give based out of that faith. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is another one. Think about it. Many of us know our hearts, our souls would be healthier if we forgave the people who have hurt us. We know that. We know that. We, we already know it. We believe that. We agree with that. But we hold on to a faith that I will not be protected if I don't protect myself. If I forgive them, it'll happen. It might not be them. It might be somebody else. And so our faith is in our understanding, the way that we can navigate the world, the way that we can protect ourselves, the way that we can insulate ourselves, the way that we can keep that pain away from ourselves. Instead of putting our faith in God, God, you've forgiven me for so much, how could I withhold that from somebody else? Look at what Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says. I love this. It is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Faith is what activated our belief through grace to cause us to move to God and receive the free gift of salvation. This comes from God. And James is saying, we cannot just simply live in the realm of belief. We must let our faith move us into action. He's talking about a living faith. So the last takeaway I want you to see, number three, is living faith is what saves us and changes our lives. A living faith. I don't want you to have a dead faith. I don't want that for you. I don't want you to be living with a dead faith. I want your faith to be alive. I want you to feel it in your bones. I want you to be like Elijah said, I got a, I got a fire shut up in my bones. I got some stuff inside of me that I just, it, it feels alive. But it could be dead. James says, James 2, look at this. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. How do you, how do you know if something is dead or alive? Just go, let's go back to high school biology, 10th grade, 11th grade. I don't know when you took it. I took it in 10th grade, okay? Maybe you were in 11th grade. High school biology. How do you know if something is dead or alive? If it's alive, it's growing. If it's alive, it's growing. It's growing. This is how we know something is alive. You know, the thing about growth, growth requires change. It requires change. We've got to be willing to be moved and shaped and grown. This is what living looks like. Living is change. Adapting to it. Growing into it. Now I need to make this statement because some of us love change so much that we change in ways that are not helpful. Not all change is positive growth. Not all change. Some of us, we have a proclivity to move in ways that it's, it's change, but it's not always good. How do we know when it's good? You know, we grow as believers when our faith transforms our belief into behaviors. It's faith. God's convicted me. I sense the faith on my life to do something in this area. And then it moves from just a belief into behavior. We grow. We grow. Maybe God's convicted you to do something about homelessness or about the foster care crisis in our community. Maybe it's cultural stuff like progressivism, wokeism. I don't know what the stuff is. Maybe it's Israel. God's convicted. Then we need to let faith cause our belief to become a behavior when we're unwilling to let faith move us. We're killing our faith. What did James said, listen, if it's not got the works associated with the belief, it's dead. Living faith, though. 
living faith is something that in our life, it's moving us, it's changing us, it's saving us. And please hear me out. Change is imperative. It's absolutely imperative. There's no growth without change. We need God's faith to move us in life because that living faith is what changes us and saves us. But I want to make this point as we wrap up today. God saves us as He changes us. This is how God saves us, as He changes us. God saves our marriage because He changes us in our marriage. God saves us in our careers because He changes how we interact with our... He saves us financially because He changes the way that we interact with resources. God saves us as He changes us. And I need you to hear this. If you're unwilling to let God change you, you will not let God save you. God saves us as He changes us. That's living faith. And that's what James wants for us. That's what James wants. So can we take a moment and pray together? Father, we come to you humbled that you would intersect our lives in a moment like this and we ask you, God, to do what only you can do. Provoke in faith a movement towards you. We know that we need you. That it is faith, which is a gift from you, that provokes us to move in belief to behavior. So we just ask you for that faith. We know it doesn't have to be a big gift because faith that's as tiny as a mustard seed can move mountains. So God, we trust you that your provision, your gift to us is more than enough. Help us today, Lord Jesus. Help us to receive that faith and to let that faith move the convictions that you've laid on our hearts into behavior. There might be some of us today that need to get involved in serving the homeless. Maybe some of us that need to get involved in the foster care crisis in our community. If there's some of us maybe that are listening and we need to get involved in an in a issue that has been deeply held in our hearts but we've never done anything personally about it. Help us to do that. And maybe today the faith that's in our heart, that might even say that there is one true God. God, we ask you to help it to move us towards surrender and submission to you. That instead of being on our team, we would get on your team and surrender. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.